Hello, my name is Adrienne Hill and I'm going to talk to you today about obsessive compulsive disorder. And a little bit about me. I taught junior high and high school mathematics for over 30 years. I have three boys. These are my three boys here. And the two on the outside, Troy and Graham, the ones with the dog and the guitar, they both have been diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. I so I have lived experience with my own children and I have volunteered for Tourette Canada for 13 years as an in-service provider talking about Tourette Syndrome Plus, which is OCD, ADHD and other uh, associated disorders. And now I am an in-service provider for the Tourette OCD Alberta Network. So let's talk about what obsessive compulsive disorder is. It's often misunderstood and hopefully by the end of today's presentation, you will actually have learned something new about the disorder as well as hopefully some strategies you can use in your classroom. So there's two parts to obsessive compulsive disorder. The first is the obsession, the second is the compulsion. Now let's talk a little bit about what obsessions are, the first component. Essentially they manifest as all these different things here, the recurrent and persistent thoughts, the urges of images that are intrusive, unwanted and repetitive, that range in frequency and nature and are very difficult to control. And they're usually marked by, well always marked by anxiety and distress. Obsessions can range from inoffensive to very intrusive and and offensive. For example, if I'm thinking, did I leave the door locked when I left work for work today? That's a normal thought. However, someone with obsessive compulsive disorder won't be able to get that thought out of their head and they will worry about it to the, uh, to the extent that they can't concentrate on anything else. And they can range from things as simple as that to thoughts of a violent or a sexual nature. Let's take a look a little bit more detail about what some of these obsessions can be. The first is contamination. I think most people have heard about this one where you know, we end up with excessive hand washing, which is the result of the thought that they are contaminated with dirt, germs, or illnesses. There's also aggressive obsessions, such as a fear of harming others. If you see a knife, you have a fear that you're gonna hurt yourself or you're gonna hurt somebody else. And sexual obsessions, so forbidden sexual thoughts and images. Magical thoughts and superstitious obsessions are also very common with lucky and unlucky numbers. Somatic obsessions, extreme concern with your health, so somatic being relating to the body, and excessive concern about body part or appearance. There's also religious obsessions that are quite common, so a fear of offending God and excessive concern with the right and wrong morality. Now the second part to obsessive compulsive disorder is the compulsive part. And these are very repetitive, deliberate. The compulsions are often referred to as rituals and they're deliberate actions that occur in an attempt to relieve the anxiety or feeling of the obsession, the, the feeling that's caused by the obsession. So the thoughts are the, the, uh, the, the obsession part and then the compulsion is what they do to relieve that, such as checking, counting, touching, rearranging things, evening things up, such as if you hit somebody in the hallway on one shoulder, you have to hit somebody on the other shoulder uh, when you're walking by to even things up. Reassurance seeking, we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's very, very common. Hand washing, is the door locked, etc. And it's usually not connected in any realistic way to what it's designed to neutralize or prevent. So it could be, you know, you flip a light switch 20 times to make it feel better, or you flip a light switch 20 times be to prevent some disaster from happening, like a tornado from hitting the school. It's not realistic. They're not connected in any real way. And it's individuals with obsessive compulsive disorder can feel like they're going crazy because they recognize that these thoughts are not rational and they can go to great lengths to hide the behaviors and thoughts. And for teachers and parents, this can it, this makes it determining learning strategies quite difficult. For example, if you have a a student who's not reading well suddenly so they've been reading really well well up to date and then all of a sudden they're not reading very well is this a learning disability is something going on or does she suddenly develop an obsession and compulsion so that if she has to every third word after reading every third word she has to count to 20. I mean that's a possibility it could be an obsessive compulsive thought. Let's look at some more specific examples. I think most people are really familiar with this hand washing one during our pandemic right now. This is 
going to feed into that quite a lot. So excessive ritualized hand washing, and I'm not talking about washing your hands for 20 seconds, I'm talking about washing your hands to the point where they're raw and doing it for minutes, hours at a time. Checking is an, another common one. I talked a little bit about checking a lock, checking whether or not toys are in order or there hasn't been anything mislaid so that you know or knocked out of position uh, checking that no mistakes are, have been made over and over and over again uh, can slow down workload for for students and repeating rituals such as rereading my middle boy who has not been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder but did have this tendency to reread and we thought he actually had a reading disorder so i took him to a psychologist he was assessed and they found out no he was rereading that's why he was reading so slowly and uh, we'll talk about some strategies for that later on and counting compulsions are very common my youngest son definitely or my sorry my oldest son had this a lot we were in the mall at one point and he was i don't know about six or seven years of age and i said hey do you want to go for a treat right now and he had a meltdown when i told him he could have a treat and i was very confused and he said i was counting mom and i said well what do you mean you were counting he said well i was counting and, and i've lost my place and i said well whereabouts were you really like 100 200 he says no it was over 2000 and i said well just start at 2000 but for someone with obsessive compulsive disorder they can't do that they have to start at one and count up again i didn't know about this disorder at that time we were undiagnosed but looking back i now understand what it was about some examples, uh, it's really important that they have a need for symmetry, evening up. So if they have a pencil on one side, they have, a, have another pencil or a pen on the other side to balance things. That's quite common. And hoarding and saving compulsions. I think the difficulty throwing things away is well, fairly well known, particularly because there's been several TV shows about it. So there's rituals that often involve other people. So... An, an example would be asking the teacher or parent, a parent repeatedly about an assignment. When is the assignment due? Is it tomorrow? Can you tell me about the assignment again? I want to make sure I understand. How many pages was that assignment? When is the assignment due? Are you sure it's tomorrow? Or is it, is it the next day? Have you marked the assignment yet after you've had, they've handed it in? When will you have the assignment marked? Will you have it marked by tomorrow? Will you mark it tonight? Now, I think we've all as teachers had students that were a little more persistent, but this is to the point where it's constant. So don't think that every student you have has OCD just because they ask these questions. But if it is constant and insistent to the point where you're having trouble getting things done then it probably needs to be addressed so the educational needs really can vary they can vary from no accommodations where they don't you don't see any evidence that this is an issue all the way up to needing special education service so it, it really depends student to student and it can depend year to year as to how they're doing. It can be month to month as well. It tends to fluctuate and change. And just be recognize that they may have com comorbid disorders such as Tourette syndrome, as my kids did, and learning disabilities. And obsessive compulsive disorder is the fourth most common psychiatric condition. Po approximately 3% of US children have the diagnosis and according to the Alberta Health website, the average age of diagnosis is 19. And you'll, you know, it, when they really get start developing, it is usually around age 12. So a lot of people go undiagnosed for a very long time. The greatest risk of developing obs obsessive compulsive disorder is from childhood to middle adulthood. It's, there's a genetic component. If you have a sibling or parent with OCD, the chances are increased. And just for your information, number one uh, psychiatric condition is depression, number two is bipolar, three is schizophrenia, and four is OCD. So recognize that obsessive compulsive disorder can be triggered by school depending upon the symptoms. For example, if a child worries that if she is away from her mother or father or brothers or sisters, that something bad will happen, going to school will obviously trigger that. And there, the fear of falling behind can also make obsessive compulsive symptoms worse. This is an obvious one. I think most teachers don't know this. You're going to consult your students and the parents and any other experts before impl implementing strategies, and you're going to plan together. So I just want to remind you that this is really important for these kids and students. 
So some things to watch out for uh, when with with regard to some of the more hidden things that can tr signify obsessive compulsive disorder. Of course, it has to be diagnosed by a medical professional. So, but these are things to watch out for. Headaches, nausea, stomach aches. My son was always feeling sick, my youngest, and we actually had to make sure that he had a plan in place that he was not allowed to go to the sick room. He was not allowed to go home for, for any reason unless he had a fever because uh, otherwise it's giving into this. Frequent hand washing, I think I've talked about that, but watch for the chapped hands. Over long bathroom breaks, they could be either doing rituals or they could be washing their hands or they could be uh, doing uh, obsessing. Shoelaces are always untied. That's usually something that, that's about contamination. They're afraid of contaminating their hands so they can't tie up their shoes. Some other things to watch out for, excessive erasing to the point where they make a hole in their paper. Uh, avoidance of sticky and messy things such as on the playground or gym equipment due to contamination fears. Somebody else has touched it, so therefore I, they've got germs, so I can't touch anything. Needless corrections, uh, words and numbers retrace. My husband actually does that. He writes something and then he traces over it again until it's just right. Some other things to watch out for, unable to hand in assignments. My, my kids, two of them, had this issue. They would actually finish the assignment and wouldn't be able to hand it in because it wasn't perfect yet. So just really watch out for that possibility. And things like not changing in the change room or participating in swimming, that goes back to that germ thing again. And carrying a seat cushion, same thing, sort of uh, the, the fear of contamination. So as long as they're, uh, if they're carrying a seat cushion for medical reasons, then that's different. But if, if not, I would question what's going on here. So also watch out for avoiding of sharp things, sharp things like compasses, pens, pencils, and, and scissors. And watch out also they can appear distractive or inattentive. I think that's the big thing is people think, I thought that about my son, he was refusing to work. But really he, what he was happening is he was thinking things over and over and over again in his head. And so it appears distracted, it, it appears inattentive, it appears purposeful. And the classic one is taking too long on tests and quizzes because they are checking and rechecking and checking again. So it's a, it's a really good way of figuring out that there may be something going on here that may need help. So people with obsessive compulsive disorder are powerfully motivated to achieve relief from their symptoms and to avoid obsessive compulsive distress if possible. They become more and more agitated to avoid, if. Uh, if they um, can't avoid what they're they're worried about or if they can't perform the rituals. So if they're not accommodated, then they can become quite aggressive and it can turn into meltdowns in the classroom. So this so just watch out for this type of thing. Classic symptoms of a obsessive compulsive disorder from K to six are the perfectionistic tendencies, excessive rewriting and rewriting and erasing, reassurance seeking that I talked about earlier. Whereas when they get older, they tend to have more avoidant behavior and this goes into adulthood. So early departures and lates are common. Uh, teens can escape classes or school entirely and lates can become common. And uh, uh, as a result of families trying to accommodate the child, but also one of the things that I've found is that some of my students with OCD can't, come into something part way through. My kids were like that as well. So if you've already started your, you know, you slept through your alarm or the power went out or something, and then you have to come to school late, then they don't want to go because they're interrupting. They're not starting at the beginning of the class and they can really distress. So they end up missing the whole day instead of just 20 minutes of a class. So that kind of thing we have to watch out for with obsessive compulsive disorder. But there's great hope because there's something called exposure and response therapy that actually myself and my kids went through. And it is actually really effective. Between 60 and 80% experience significant improvement in symptoms. And the biggest thing is a two year follow up, they're still good. They're doing really well as long as they don't give in to their fears. Giving in to their fears and their obsessions and compulsions can backtrack them. But as long as you maintain this exposure and response therapy type thinking, then it can be maintained. And my kids are definitely proof of that. Uh, symptoms can improve within 12 to 15 sessions. Of course, this depends greatly on the severity as well as each individual. 
I know that it would take usually between four and six months for any particular obsession to be overcome with my kids. And it probably was in the range of 12 to 15 sessions. But don't forget, there were multiple things, multiple issues. This was a many years uh, involvement with professionals for my kids to overcome this. And, and a good way of thinking of exposure and response therapy is what do you do when you have to overcome a fear of heights, you go to very high places. And there's also a lot of thoughts that you have to address to try and overcome this. So one of the things that's interesting is the extra time thing with obsessive compulsive disorder. Giving in limited time can help identify issues. So it can help identify, do they have obsessive compulsive disorder? Do they have ADHD? Do they have Tourette syndrome? Do they have learning disabilities? So I, I always gave all my students extra time right at the beginning and I worked at Chinook Learning for the last 13 years of my career and we were able to identify lots of students with issues just by giving them extra time and if they took double time we knew that there was something going on. And the problem though is that extra time can feed into obsessive compulsive perfectionistic tendencies and allow for too much rechecking. They can recheck and recheck. And so that was one of the things I quite often would ask my students, you took a long time to do this. Why did you take so long? And some students would say, oh, because you gave me that much time. I was done long ago, but I thought I'd just read through it again. That's not a concern. But if they're going to recheck and recheck and they get stuck, that's, that's another issue. So extra time might be necessary if a different issue is being worked on, like if, um, you know, you, you still need to give extra time to people with obsessive compulsive disorder while you're working on different issues, such as maybe the light switch flipping is the thing you got to work on. So you can't just say, oh, I'm not going to give you got OCD. I'm not going to give you extra time. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying be aware that it could be feeding into it and maybe work into the plan something that will change that over time. And that might be years. It might not just be a few months. It might not be while you're having that student, but maybe two, three, four, five years from now. So, because it's not good to overwhelm a student by working on too many things at once. One or two issues at a time is what's recommended, and it depends greatly on the individual. It's important to start with achievable goals and balance this with the most urgent issue. And I think most teachers are aware of that. So, so it's, but just remember, extra time is not sustainable in the long run. run. So you want to gradually decrease extra time if they have the diagnosis of OCD. Now, if they have a learning disability, then you're going to need that extra time still. And this, as I said, possibly over years. So one of the things you need to do is to set a plan up with the student and the parents to try to limit things like excessive reassurance seeking, checking temperature over and over again. That's if they, they're worried about being sick, uh, calling home repeatedly to make sure the family is okay, or lying down to take a break. Uh, you need to limit the number of times that they can ask a question or take their temperature. And how are you gonna help? Make a written plan, and sh but the big thing here is you want to ensure success. So you want to make sure that they, you know, you may be moving in like not inches even, but millimeters and just ensure that success. We had to move so slowly with our kids at first, and then they start taking really big leaps as we move forward. So for example, if the person is asking 20 questions, you know, in an hour, then you can say, okay, what's a reasonable amount you could, feel you can ask today and they might say well 19 when you say well no no we you know maybe that's what you can do but that's too disruptive for the class make make sure that they can ask the questions maybe by writing them down etc have other ways maybe speaking into the uh, the microphone of their phone those types of things but you can ask me only three questions per day or maybe it's five questions you have to figure it out and you know you can check your temperature four times per day and you can have one bathroom break for five minutes, but you have to work this out and go slowly and try and figure out what can work for that student. And practice the plan. You need to practice it with them, how they can do it, especially if you've asked them to do the questions by writing them down or speaking into the phone, that they need to practice that so that they understand what it's like. And role playing can feel awkward and artificial. I totally get that. But we did a lot of it when in with my kids and it did help. And it's it's especially helpful for when things go wrong. The plan will be more easily implemented. You should have a plan. Okay, you, this didn't work. So what's plan B? You, you obviously asked me 
10 questions today, uh, we need to figure out something else. Have and the big thing, reward success, have a reward system in place that is clear and concise. The student will most likely have to be reminded of the reward because they're gonna melt down at some point. Like I said, you withdraw accommodations, you are going to have a reaction. And it's best to have rewards that are set up for both school and home, short term in the moment and long term the end of the day and not end of month because that's especially for younger kids that's really hard to understand. And so it really needs to be short term and end of the day. And I'm not talking about it has to be some expensive toy, it could be reading time, it could be uh, a game time, it can be allowing to go for a walk, whatever it may be. They love to read books, that kind of thing. And Remords at the end of the month are okay for older students, just not your younger students. It's not going to happen. We need to guarantee success. Otherwise, you know, the chances of progress decline. And, you know, start with achievable goals. I think I've talked about that. And you're going to prioritize to allow for success. And this is the big one here. Be okay with exposing students to distress because it can be really difficult to purposely put a student into a distressing situation. It was very hard for me as a parent to make my kids uncomfortable. And exposure and response therapy is all about making them uncomfortable, but with kindness. And I think it's really important to, to recognize that the, the distress that they're going through. So just recognize that you're helping that student solidify lifelong strategies of coping with their obsessive compulsive tendencies or disorder. This is not much different than, than getting students ready for writing an exam. Nobody wants to write an exam, it's an unpleasant experience, but you still do it because you want them to do well. Or say doing a presentation in front of the class. Remember to be kind and discuss the plan with the parents and the student before attempting exposure. The plan must be agreed upon by the student for success to occur. I think that most, well, we all know that. Uh, so remember not denying, you are not denying them support, but you're modifying it. So you actually are supporting them. Uh, it just doesn't feel like it in the moment. And just use compassion and praise. I'm going to keep saying that. Just be kind and recognize that this is not easy for them, especially when they're younger. It's, it can be really frightening. So ideally, it would be great to adopt an exposure model within the school because it's not just people who have diagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder that could benefit from this type of thoughts and, and thinking, meaning and also recognize that you need to make the exposures count for marks or else they're not meaningful. And also remember that your progress is not going to be linear. You're going to have to set back. So you're going to be going along and you're doing well. And you're, oh, this is great. They're doing so well. And then they're going to backtrack and then they're going to carry on. Uh, you know, as long as you're consistent, progress will improve. It's just that expect setbacks and they're going to have bad days. We all have bad days. So if they have a bad day, they're going to have a harder time pushing through their fears. So it's really important to reduce access to comfortable places. Students with obsessive compulsive disorder can get into an avoidance cycle where they seek places that reduce their anxiety. And so we need to make sure that we reduce that if we can. Again, this is all part of the plan. One thing you work, I mean, this may be what you're gonna work on. So you just reduce, gradually reduce the passes to safe retreats. So uh, such as quiet rooms, libraries, uh, but you need to be in consultant, consultation with students and parents and possibly psychologists if they are available. And you're going to gradually, I think, there we go, <laughs> gradually eliminate the accommodations. As student knee improves, you slowly wean them off their accommodations. But remember, it will take time, if not months, maybe years. And remember, disruptive and poor behavior will initially increase when an accommodation is withdrawn, but should be short lived. One of the things that I know the psychologist talked about with my kids is that the, when you start these exposure and response things, the anxiety goes way up first before it goes down and drops down. So do expect some disruptive or poor behavior and so maybe have something ready that they that this would be when you'd need them maybe to go to a room to calm down just for the sake of the class. So this is something that I did at my school probably about uh, five years in 
what I was finding at Chinook Learning was that my first exam that I would give every single year, I would have at least two to three students who would completely melt down during my, when I handed the test or even before they would even get in the room or I would get emails saying I couldn't come. And what I recognized with the work I was doing with my own kids is that these kids were suffering from pretty severe anxiety and some of them were obsessive compulsive. So what I started doing was I started giving an anxiety talk in my math class every year for about 30 minutes. And what it did is it completely eliminated those meltdowns on the first test. It was amazing. So I spent 30 minutes every semester and it made a huge, huge distance a huge huge difference for my students and what did that what did that look like first of all I told them I'm not going to reassure them so I wasn't going to say don't worry about it you're going to do fine on the test I actually discussed that failure is possible because usually if I said what's your worst fear they say I'm going to fail and I said yeah failure is possible and what was really funny is when I gave this talk and then they came the day of the test and they said I'm afraid I'm going to fail I said yeah failure is possible they actually smiled they went oh yeah that's what she said she was going to say. So, you know, it kind of relieved the stress. And this is quite well known for, for many teachers, but I just wanted to reiterate it. It's really important for people who are anxious. Now, if you're not anxious and you don't care, this is not going to do anything. It's a wasted time exercise. But if the person is anxious, if they can take the first 10 minutes on any quiz or exam and write down all their worst fears about failing, say, I'm afraid my parents are going to be upset. I'm not going to get into the university I want. I'm not going to be successful. I won't graduate. Whatever their fears are, write them down for the first 10 minutes. Again, this is only helpful for people who have anxiety. So it's very specific. And I would tell them, you can go for a walk. If you're partway through the exam and you just can't handle it, you're going to go for a walk and you're going to think about all your worst fears. So you're not going to go for a walk to calm down. You're going to go for a walk to face your worst fears. You're going to think about failing and then you're going to try and sit down and relax and do deep breathing and go to your happy place. But the most important part of this is actually to expose yourself to your worst fear. And if they really get stuck, because these are usually bright kids that are, know their stuff, they've studied. These are not your kids that are just making an excuse. These are kids who really are struggling to get through this. I give them a hint, and it's amazing. A little tiny hint, and away they go. And then we celebrate. And we celebrate that they actually got through it. I actually have one student who was ex very, very extreme. And the very first day, she I was able to, the, the goal of for that day, for the very first exam, was just for her to come. She didn't even have to write the test. But because she got there, I said, hey, do you think you might just try? I mean, I don't care if you don't write anything down. I'm just going to give it to you, and you're just going to look at it. And then I said, why don't you just see how many you can do? So we were these little tiny baby steps. Well, it turned out she got 78% like or something like that. This, this girl was brilliant, so she should have been in probably the 90s, but the anxiety was so severe. And so we celebrated the fact, number one, she got to class. Number two, she was able to write even just part of the exam. And number three, that she not only wrote the exam, but she passed. And so those were really great things. This student was so severe though, that when it came to the diploma exam, we could not get her in to write it. But I did get a note a few years later. Remember I said it takes years before some people can get through some of these things. I got a note from her saying she did finally write the exam. Of course she got in the nineties, She's a brilliant girl. And so I was so thrilled for her. She did finally push through. And uh, we actually, had her diagnosed through Chinook Learning. So what is really counterproductive, this is the things that are tend to be on websites for test writing. It's actually counterproductive to say, you'll be fine, don't worry, it's not scary. You just don't think about it. You actually need to face your fears. You should be able to do this. You did this yesterday, why can't you do it today? So it's okay actually to remind students, hey, don't feel bad about today, today's a bad day. Let's focus, remember how well you did on the last exam. You know, you're gonna get back there, don't worry. So don't use it sort of like a punishment kind of an idea, you know, like rolling your eyes. Be kind when they have, when you say this kind of thing. So do remind them of their success, but be careful about that. 
So I want to talk a little bit about transitions. Transitions are very difficult for people with Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive dis disorder. So, but the problem is, is if you give in to that, I know my son was given lots of warning when there was going to be a fire drill. And that's great. I think that it's really good to have those warnings, but it's really important to reduce the warnings. So it can be a slow process. Start with asking a student how long a warning they need for the change. If it is the day before, slowly decrease the length of time of the war uh, to the warning until it is minimal, say five minutes. Then offer no warning. And the student needs to know there will be no warning. And this is planned with the student. Are you ready for no warning? And if they say yes, then we're going to go for it. And of course, sometimes no warning is going to happen anyway. And those are great. That's really important that they they recognize if it does happen, you say, hey, look, you survived. You did awesome. Even if they had a little meltdown, they still survived. So at first, the progress is going to be slow. The anxiety usually gets worse before it gets better, like I said before. But once they realize they will survive, progress usually speeds up. So another thing to practice besides, you know, assemblies and fire drills and field trips is surprise quizzes. And I know all students hate surprise quizzes, but make it fun and have a joke in it. And it will help be a good way of reducing the anxiety, but you still have to make it worth something or else it's not going to be as effective. And for testing, if possible, temporarily remove your long answer questions that be aware that students with obsessive compulsive disorder may do better with multiple choice tests. It can reduce the checking tendency. So that's the reason th for that, is it they don't have to have a perfect sentence. The sentences are already there. It can be better for the student to practice those long answer questions at home where the parents can help. But obviously that's not always gonna be possible, but just be aware that this is something that can help. Now, if you have an example where someone has a contamination feel, fear and then there was somebody who vomited in the classroom that student may not be able to go back in the classroom and if you have something like this you can practice after school because you're going to need to practice obviously not in in during class time because you have to teach a class so have you know maybe a parent or a friend to help with this after school where they can be in a safe place in the school and a, teach, an a, a teacher, the aide or parent or friend can bring progressively more fearful items from the classroom to the student. So they take, say, a chair out to the student and then they sit on it, etc. And then you start moving closer to the classroom and bringing the items from the classroom to the stool. To, to the student, and then eventually you move them into the classroom. This can take a long time, it, but you can get them back in. So that's an, ex, an example of an exposure that can happen as a result of fear of contamination. So this one is tough, combating school avoidance. My youngest son had this issue. We, he was very, very fearful of going to school because he was afraid he'd get a migraine, which had happened a few times and then it just became it got out of control he essentially didn't go to school for several months and so we had to take a really really slow approach and have a really big re consistent reward system used and agreed upon beforehand so the first day say we spent an hour in the car in the parking lot and then went home and then the next day we get to the parking lot and then we walk to the entrance way of the school and we just stay there for a while sometimes we would walk around the school and that would help. Then the next thing you go into the maybe the library or another safe place. For my son, it was he loved the vice principal. So we went into the vice principal's office and sat in with him for a little while. And then they can attend one class and and then maybe another class. And we had days where there, we would show up at school and he just couldn't go in. So that's what I'm talking about, you know, going backwards a little bit. But then the next day, he'd be able to go for the whole day. So you're going to have expect bad days and regressing and don't forget to reward progress in the effort but, but you need to continue to set that bar slightly higher in response to success so you have to keep moving forward so this i talked a little bit about lates earlier on if late they may choose to avoid the whole class so you need to make a plan to practice and reward lates we actually had to do that with my youngest son as well 
we knew that we had to do this when one day our alarm didn't go off and we were going to be late and he had a huge meltdown. So we made an agreement that we would go into school every day at 10.10 because that's when the office could handle him the most. And the first day he screamed from 10.10 until lunchtime and the principal phoned me and said, help me please. So, and that's when I got on the phone to him, reminded him of his reward, which was some little tiny Lego thing and he calmed down and he made it through the day and four days later he said mom let's practice being late so i knew we were good and things we've never had a problem after that so that's the thing with the rewards you reward them to get through the anxiety once the anxiety is gone the rewards are gone as well so it's really important to not draw attention to late students if you can and if you do it's in a kind way and again reward the progress i talked about that expect the bad days regressing continue to set the bar higher so you can see a pattern happening here so when it's really important that you have a rating system to determine the stress levels and i know elementary school teachers are really good at this they usually have like happy faces on the on the front of the desk and they have different you know happy sad all the way down to sad or frustrated those are great. I think that's because especially younger kids will have trouble telling you that they're really getting distressed and this way it can really help with the communication. I found this really helpful. Uh, you can use a scale of one to 10. I use that a lot with my students who were very anxious. Or you can set up things like a fear thermometer. You know, where, where on the thermometer are you with this? So we use beakers a lot in our household. That's why there's a beaker there. So is your beaker half full or is it really full? Like, where are you at with regards to your anxiety? So if this, the scale is important, but you, you know, and you need, it's nice if you can have a verbal one, but sometimes they're so shut down that they can't talk to you. So you might need to have like fingers, you know, five out of 10 or whatever. Uh, it's, and it's really important if they're really stressed that you don't talk to them right now but about strategies, et cetera. You may wait for them to calm down and then you can discuss the reality of their fear, et cetera. So some more ways to help. I think it's really important for these people to make note of their daily, weekly, and monthly successes. They can do that themselves. But for especially for younger kids, I think it's really important that you know the teacher does this and the parents do this so that they can have, uh, have something tracked. And I think it's still important. I think we're hard on ourselves and it's really nice if somebody else does this for us every once in a while, even when they get older. And remind them how far they've come and this is a, a really important one please don't punish for behaviors they have no control over so if they're having trouble with lates to punish them just it, it just makes things worse it doesn't help and so uh, in attention to do to um compulsive thoughts and fears so remember that they're going to have lots of inattention so don't punish them for things like uh, inattention in the class because it may be beyond their control and of course absences but at the same time you need to set clear limits and consequences and those as uh, need to, that's where the IPP comes in it's really important to discuss that kind of thing and just be aware that even you know I gave the example of evening up so you know if you somebody bumps into them here and then they body check somebody in the hallway that's not good so if a student pushes or hits someone due to fear of contamination because someone was too close or need they need to even up it needs to be dealt with but make sure you discuss ahead of time so the student knows what to expect uh, one of the big things with obsessive compulsive disorder are thought loops so we need to have some strategies for thought loops uh, they just can't get started they get stuck so they will sit and appear to be refusing to work when what may be happening is their thoughts are circling around and they can't decide on the perfect word, sentence, or topic. So I'm going to show you uh, how you can do a writing exercise with students who can't get started choosing any written topic. Uh, in my math class, I've actually helped students who were having trouble with deciding on topics in English and social studies. And I've helped, and it's, this has never failed to work. It's amazing. I really don't understand why it works. This was something given to me by the psychologist for my oldest son. So first of all, you need to brainstorm a topic. Uh, and, but before I get into that, what happens with people with obsessive compulsive disorder is none of the topics are just perfect enough for them to, there's always a flaw and they just are so afraid of not choosing the perfect topic. So they sit there 
and they can't move forward. So the first thing you're going to do is brainstorm topics if they're not provided. And that, you know, you just write down anything, even if it's silly. And usually there will be something silly in there. And you're going to write, and, and if the topics are provided, you just write down all the topics on paper. So once you come up with topics, you write it on the paper, or if they're provided, you write them on paper. Then you're going to do like what the picture says, you're going to crumple them up. You're going to throw them around, mix them up, and then you're going to select one. And what's really funny, and this happened several times, quite often they would go, oh yeah, that, that's good, I'll take that topic. But they really usually did have a favorite one, but because they couldn't get through that looping thoughts, they just couldn't bring themselves to choose it. So they choose topic A, but they really wanted topic C, and they will change, but they, it's just enough to get them to go through. I don't understand why, but it does work. It works very, very well. And of course, you praise and reward just by saying, hey, way to go, you picked your topic, well done. Now, there has to be strategies for keeping going because they can really, if their thoughts aren't right and they can't get that sentence down, it can be a huge problem. So as a writing example, what you're going to do is you're going to practice nonstop writing. So you're going to say, okay, we're going to write for 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever, however, however many minutes they feel is good. So 15 minutes is always a good one for older students, maybe five minutes for younger students, and you practice nonstop writing. And if they can't think of anything, if they have to write ba 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 or yippity doo da, that's what they write. They have to keep writing no matter what. And that really uh, stops that perfectionistic, that helps them get through the the idea that if I don't have it perfect, something terrible is going to happen. They'll realize when they push through this that nothing terrible will happen. And then you're going to assess quantity, not quality. So you get, you know, so it's worth something. You'll get, if you get a full paragraph, you know, however many lines, then you get 10 out of 10. And then you gradually increase expectations of quality with editing and you shorten the time limits or increase them, whatever it is that you need to have done. As you're older, you might need a three hour essay and do 15 minutes a day or half an hour a day. Set reasonable daily goals for, for completion. And of course, using a computer is hugely helpful because then you don't have to worry about the perfection of writing. You can type and so that's uh, that that part goes away. However, my son, my oldest son, couldn't even write on the computer unless the per in, in his head his sentence was perfect, and he he had a brilliant high school English teacher who said just cover your monitor and it worked. So just covering the monitor so he couldn't see what he was typing and away he went. He was in high school at the time for that. So younger children that wouldn't be as good for. That's when scribing comes in handy. So rereading and rereading issues. I talked a little bit about my middle boy. We thought he had a reading dis disability and it turned out he was rereading. You know, the obsessive compulsive tendencies are in the family. And so what do you do? Well, you can take a piece of paper over what has been read. So if you have a textbook and then they cover anything that they've read and they have to keep moving it down. And it worked really well for him. His reading went up. If you need to, you can really create a cardboard cutout because some people like to jump down, especially if they have, say, OCD and ADHD, then you can cut out a window so that they can only see one line at a time because that, that will prevent not only rereading, but jumping forward. And of course, uh, text-to-speech software is always helpful. So to finish off, I just want to tell you what we as the Tourette OCD Network, how we can help you. So we can actually come into your class and give great specific presentations about Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder. We have a great little empathy exercise. It really feeds well into schools anti-bullying policies. Uh, we can do teacher professional development and we can give support for strategies in specific situations. So if you have a student who has some of these issues, please feel free to contact us and we can help you out. So thank you so much for, um, for having me and for listening to me <laughs> over the internet. And uh, I just like to finish off with this little joke here, which is, you know, what really grinds my gears when people say they have OCD, when in reality, they just prefer things to be neat and organized. 
So just remember, obsessive compulsive disorder is a spectrum disorder, and if they like things neat and organized, it does not mean they have OCD, but if they sit there and neat, make things neat and organized for days at a time at the expense of doing anything else, it probably is OCD. And thank you again for having me speak and or listening to me speak. And I like this one as well. I have CDO. It's like OCD, but the letters are in alphabetical order like they should be. Thank you so much.